I got to run. That's all I got. And, and so I'm starting to run, and I think, oh, crap, I better go back to the car because they're just going to chase me in this car. So I take the keys out, throw the keys as far as I can, start running again. Dude's still on the ground. So at this point, I'm like, I don't know, what's, I don't know what just happened. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Abroaders Travel Podcast, your weekly meetup with thousands of entrepreneurs, hustlers, creators, nomads, ninjas, wanderers, and world changers, all seeking to build the skills and connections to live a life without borders. If you want to learn more about what we do or download our entire podcast archive, check out the website, abroaders.com. Happy Wednesday morning and welcome to another episode of the Abroaders Podcast. I'm Eric, checking with you guys from Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam. This week, I had a chance to sit down and interview Jordan Harbinger from the Art of Charm podcast. Jordan is actually a really big reason why the Abroader show got off to such a great start. He is a classic example of, of sort of how chipping away and offering value to other people can pay off huge. So I had been a listener of Jordan's show for a long time. It's a, a really high quality podcast. So I reached out to him and, and asked him if he'd be interested in some help uh, using points to, to redeem for travel. And so that sort of led to a back and forth. And eventually Jordan asked me to come on the Art of Charm podcast, which was a huge boost. They've got millions of downloads. And so it, it really gave us some, some exposure at a level that we would have never achieved at, at that early stage. Uh, so anyways, I sit down and talk with uh, Jordan. He's got some really crazy travel stories, including how he escaped from a kidnapping incident in Mexico by putting his captor in a sleeper hold. Hopefully that doesn't scare any of you would-be travelers away from future adventures. We also talk quite a bit about business. Jordan's a big authority in the personal development space. He's worked with a huge range of clients from military to Navy SEALs to high-level executives to help them master critical communication skills. And I think some, some pretty interesting insights come out in our conversation about nonverbal communication and making first impressions and leveling up your personal relationships and your network. So hopefully you guys get as much out of this as I did. Enjoy the interview. As I mentioned at the top of the show, I'm really excited to have Jordan Harbinger from Art of Charm podcast as a guest for today's episode. Jordan runs a really impressive personal development coaching service, helping people improve the quality of both their business and personal relationships. He's also a really well-traveled dude, speaks a couple of languages, and has spent a bit of time in Europe, Middle East, and Latin America. So, yeah, thanks for being on the show, man. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. So, I got to start with the question I'm most curious to ask. You've been kidnapped not once, but twice in a foreign country. Are you just incredibly unlucky? Tell me, tell me about the experience, man. Yeah, I mean, without getting into all the detail that would, you know, result in people being like, wah, wah, um, I, I did get kidnapped in Mexico literally like 15 years ago. Um, no, 14 years ago now. Uh, and it was just like a shady, fake cabbie in a ghetto area where I lived because I was sleeping on a roof in like a really crappy part of Mexico City. And, you know, I made some really rookie mistakes, like getting in the car and being like, hey, I only have credit cards, so I have to hit an ATM on the way, you know, and the <laughs> dressing up like really nice because I was going downtown. And then I was a white guy and I had blonde, fake blonde hair at the time because I was like 20. And the guy was like, no problem. And I was like, you know, looking back, obviously, that was just so stupid. It was such a gringo move. Uh, but, you know, I kind of think maybe... It would have been one of those like, hey, take money out of the machines and then your card stops working and then they just leave you in somewhere near the last ATM where it failed. But you never know. I could have also gotten chopped up into little pieces in a basement someplace. Yeah, <laughs> certainly glad that it didn't work out uh, on uh, the latter end there. Um, I mean, tell me a little bit, you know, if you're in one of those situations, you know, making a decision in a jam is, is pretty key. How do you sort of decide if, you know, you're going to punch the guy out? When do you run? When do you play it cool? Yeah, so that was that's a really good question. And the way that it worked out for me was I sort of figured out what was going maybe going on by asking him questions. Instead of just, like, a lot of people when they're scared, they just get quiet. And then your brain starts rationalizing that it's not really happening and that it's going to be fine and that, you know, you're going to be able to figure out some way. But the truth of the matter is you never want to go to what's called the secondary location, right? And the secondary location is the proverbial place where nobody can hear you scream. So you, you, you might have gotten 
You, you say, say the cat. Okay, so the cab driver situation, you don't know you're being kidnapped because you're not getting shoved into a car. You're right. getting into a car, and then suddenly you're like, hey, we're not going towards where I said to. Oh, I need directions. And then I'm like, wait a minute. You know, I'm asking to go to Sokalo, which is like presidential palace, middle of downtown. He needs directions. It's like, come on, man. You know, you're a cabbie in Mexico City. That's like a cabbie in Washington, D.C. And you're like, I want to stop in front of the White House. And they're like, where's that? Let me get directions. You know, totally unreasonable. And then, you know, I thought I started going, oh, language barrier or maybe there's traffic and that's what he means. And then I was like, we're just going further away. How much longer am I going to sit here and lie to myself that this isn't really happening? And I'm clearly being taken away from my destination he seems shady. This is luckily before mobile phone, so he couldn't call and have anybody waiting for us at this place where we ended up. But I'm like, okay, I'm going to look for chances to escape. And the earlier you find out what's going on, the more of an advantage you have. So I started to figure it out, and I was like, okay, I'm, we're going way too fast for me to just like tuck and roll. I'm going to be broken into pieces if I do that. And he kept blowing lights because I think he thought, all right, this guy's going to going to tuck and roll. And then eventually there just weren't any lights anymore because we're in this like ghetto ass area. And I was like, I don't know what's on the side of the road. If I could tuck and roll and end up in a friggin', you know, 16 foot deep ditch that I can't get out of, I don't know where the hell I'm at, you know? So I, I, I didn't want to get out of the car. And then I tried to get out of the car a few times when I could. And the door lock wasn't working because it was like a screw that went below the, below the door, you know? Mm -hmm. And I was like, either this cab is just coincidentally really ghetto or this thing is designed for this. And that's when I started getting freaked out because I was like, oh my God, this guy's done this before. Like, what the hell? This is really scary. So I slid behind him and he stopped in front of this like crappy house. And I was like, don't get out of the car. And he's like, okay, calm down, calm down. And I'm like, do not get out of the car, turn around and drive back. And he's like, okay, relax, you know, and this is all in Spanish. And so I put my arm between him and the door but he didn't see that and mm -hmm. he made a fast one for the door but I had my arm there and I was like nope and I pulled him back into the seat and at that point I reached up and choked him out from wow. behind the seat incredible and, man yeah, it's really I important was, to, to know kind of when to keep your cool because I mean obviously somebody else maybe panicked in that situation and did try and jump out and you know ended up hitting something on the side of the road or whatever uh, and just yeah, kind of I'm, evaluating that situation to, to know when course. to time and dude, don't get me wrong. I was definitely super scared and shaking. You know, when your adrenaline kicks up so much, you're shaking. I, I for sure had that because I was like, this is bad. But I remembered to just like, all right, you know, don't go to the secondary location. We're kind of there, but I'm not in the basement yet being like, please don't kill me. Right. I'm, I'm like, no, I'm not going in that house. And I just decided this is like standoff zone. This is where I get to decide whether or not this ends my way or his way. And so... And I had, you know, I'd been working out a ton. I was 20. I was in great shape. This guy was probably like early 50s, you know, been sitting in a cab a lot. He was a little bit overweight. I was like, I can win against this guy. And, I, you know, I looked up near the dashboard and I didn't see anything sharp or, you know, knives or anything. And, and I knew that he had about maybe four seconds uh, while I, because I, I, you know, I worked at a security company before in Detroit. So I know you've got about three and a half, four seconds max. So I figured the first second or two, he's going to be panicking that he's being choked out. And then he's going to go, oh, I've got a knife over in the, you know, near the dashboard. And he's going to reach for that. I'm going to be yoinking him around. He's probably going to miss. And then he's going to be asleep. So, nice, man. I, you know, I didn't think about all that, but I thought I have time. And unless something is really readily accessible and I didn't see anything. And I, you know, I, I tried to like look on his belt and stuff. But at that point, I'm kind of like, I had decided even if this dude just jams a freaking switchblade through my forearm I it's better than what's going to happen in this basement so I was like I was I wasn't going to let go I was like an alligator with the jaws closed by the time I got him so I took him out of the car after that and I was luckily you know I I figured there's probably like five huge dudes in this house so you know luckily it wasn't well lit so I opened the door from his end I'm pushing him out of the car I'm trying to climb over the console and then, like, climb, push him out of the car. I had no leverage, you know, and I'm trying to climb through his door. It's a huge pain. So I get him out, and then I find out that, shit, I can't drive a stick. Oh, no. You know? And I'm like, this sucks, you know. So I was in trouble, and so I was like, wait a minute. I've done this before. I can remember how to do this. 
trying is, to figure out. That is by far to, the best story of learning how to drive a stick on the fly. That I I've, didn't uh, learn. I, it would have been if I had learned how to drive a stick on the fly, but I didn't. I'd done it before. I tried. And not only was this a stick, but this is like a, what, 1968 Volkswagen Beetle <laughs> stick shift. I, I wasn't, I didn't even know where the friggin' clutch was. It's dark, and the, the thing is, like, I'm revving the engine, and I'm like, that's not what I want to do right now. This guy's going to wake up any second. Someone could come out of the house. What the hell's going to happen? So I'm like, I realize I can't figure out this car. Even if it was a good, even if it was a good stick, I probably couldn't have driven it, but this thing, you know, it's like rusty, and it's not moving, it's grinding, and it's it's an old-ass car. So I'm, I realize if they, I got to run. That's all I got, and and so I'm starting to run, and I think, oh crap! I better go back to the car because they're just going to chase me in this car. So I take the keys out, throw the keys as far as I can, start running again. Dude's still on the ground. So at this point, I'm like, I don't know what's, I don't know what just happened. I run as far as I can. I'm wearing like a Banana Republic friggin' dress shirt, soaked through with sweat. Some something called chinos, which is a fancy word for pants. Nice shoes, and I'm running through this on this dirt road side of this road on the f- suburbs of Mexico City towards the last main street I can find, and I feel like I'm running forever. And of course, I'm looking behind me, and they're kind of backlit by like one light from a you know store or something like that, and I don't see anyone. But you know, I'm constantly my eyes are playing tricks on me, and I realize the more I s- try to stare behind me, the more chances they have to actually be getting closer if somebody is here. So I'm my mind is going crazy. I am not calm. Yeah, I can totally imagine, man. Uh, well, so I mean, tell me, did did this experience? This was when you were really young, right? You said you were twenty. Got to be pretty early years. in your your traveling career. Did that kind of change your approach, or I mean, did you just kind of get right back up on the on the horse and and continue to travel after after having that experience? Well, I, I continue to travel, but bear in mind, I moved to Mexico from Jerusalem, where I had spent a bunch of time hanging out in the old city during like riots and all this stuff. Because the second Intifada or second uprising right. of the Palestinian territories started while I was in the old city of Jerusalem, and this knucklehead Ariel Sharon went up to the Temple Mount, which is a sacred site for both Islam. There's something called Dome of the Rock, you know, if people know what that is. And he went up there, and people went crazy. And then people were throwing rocks and shooting and stuff, and it was crazy. And I was there with my Jordanian Arab roommate, and so we were running around, and he's like, here's the plan. If they're Jews, you say we're Americans. If they're Arabs, I'll say we're Arabs, and we just keep running. I'm like, sounds good to me, because he spoke fluent Arabic, and I could you know, say something in English or, or even just bad English-accented Hebrew that was like, we're Americans, and they'd just be like, all right, get out of here, you know? So... We ran through a bunch of Israeli checkpoints, past some crazy rioting kids and stuff, not or and non kids throwing rocks. My roommate got hit with a rock. I got hit with a wooden board that didn't really hurt, but scared the crap out of me. And like you know, we got back and and then we're seeing helicopters over our apartment shooting you know tear gas and stuff. And yeah, they're just they they blew up people's backpacks. If you forget your backpack in Israel, they detonate it because they think it's a bomb. So they'll blow this stuff up outside the door. And I mean, I went through that all the time. So for me, this was like an action-packed thing that happened in a place that was a lot sleepier than the last action-packed place I was. The thing is, this affected me way more directly than some just event happening around you is so much different. Yeah, a lot than more personal. Actively, yeah, it's so much more personal. So. It changed a little bit in that I was like, wow, you know, that, but I had already gone through that moment of, of any person's life, and maybe I should say man's life, but any person's life where you realize you're not immortal. I'd already done that because when I worked in Detroit, I saw people get shot right near me. I saw people get really badly hurt right near me. I heard other people, you know, decently while I had, when I had to, I mean, I saw brawls, I was in brawls, like I'm not a tough person really like a physically tough person at all i just got back from the gym and this like five foot tall personal trainer kicked my ass and she (laughs) just made me you know cry but like i know how to navigate situations like that from experience so the mexico thing freaked me out and i did move out of mexico city but not because i was like it's not safe here but because i was i went and when i finally got into a car on the road um due to just massive persuasion and a really nice girl who was with a guy who didn't want to pick me up and blah, blah, blah. I was like, police station. And the guy was like, whoa, dude, 
you're new to Mexico, huh? If I take you to the police station, there's a 50-50 chance that they're going to either drive you back here or they're going to be like, oh, let's see. What we gather from this story is that there might be a dead cab driver somewhere. Let's go chart. Let's go mess with you on that and then make right. you bribe your way out of that. So he's like, your best bet is to just never, just pretend like this never happened. Do not go back to the place where this guy picked you up because they're going to look for you there. Mm -hmm. And he's like, you, do, you have to move or, or, or like lay low. And I'm like, I'm not laying low in a barrio in Mexico City. I'm out of here. I have the freedom to get the hell out. So I moved to a different city in Mexico altogether in a different state. Very cool. Yeah, I think uh, travel definitely gives you a ton of, of uh, experience that reacting to situations that aren't expected. Obviously, those ones that are, are pretty serious, but also, uh, you know, just in terms of, of personal development, I think people that have had more of a chance to, to see new places in the world are, are better equipped to, to deal with unexpected situations. Yeah, it's so true. I mean, this, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to maybe, well, I hate even joking about it, but you don't have to hurt a cab driver in Mexico and get kidnapped in order to learn how to do things on the fly when traveling. I mean, I remember getting picked up by like fake Hungarian police and stuff like that and, and it, real Hungarian police and, you know, real Ukrainian police and stuff like that, just walking around, you yeah. know, in, in like 2003 and then being like, oh, why don't you get in the car? And, I, and then remembering like the one American guy that I knew there was like, hey, piece of advice, police tell you to get in the car, never get in the car. And I'm like, uh, okay, no, I'm not getting in the car. And just like dealing with stuff like that and even even on the, if you're a less sort of adventurous traveler, then you might even just miss a train and have to like sleep in a train station overnight and have to figure out in a, a Hungarian how to navigate the train schedule because they didn't bother putting one up in English in 1998. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. So, there's tons of that stuff when traveling. Or people tell you, oh, it's coming soon, and they mean like three days, and you meant like an hour, you know? Mm -hmm. So you're sitting there waiting for the train, and they're like, why are you still sitting here? It's coming soon. And you're like, ah, that doesn't mean the same thing he thinks it means, you know? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Me. Well, listen, I want to transition a little bit and talk a, a bit about the art of charm. So you guys have, have guys coming in from all over the world for, for your week-long programs. Tell me a little bit about what are some of the big universal issues or problems that, that folks come to you guys to, for help? Sure. I mean, people don't really come to us for help specifically. I mean, I, actually, th that's sort of a lie. Uh, they do come for help, but by that time, they're usually kind of behind where most guys come to the Art of Charm. Most guys come to the Art of Charm because they want to learn personal magnetism, charisma, the way they sit, stand, walk, present themselves, generate networking connections for business and personal relationships, dating stuff. They want to learn and master that stuff. And the people that understand the value of that are usually not remedial. Right. Usually the people who understand the value of that stuff are like, oh, I can get a 5% edge on pretty much the most important skill set for the rest of my life. Yeah, I want that. By the time, it's, it's funny because the guys who are like, oh, I haven't had a girlfriend in a year and I really need this. Those are the guys that when you tell them, hey, it's a week in LA, they're like, oh, that's too far. And I'm like, okay, good luck being lonely, next. Yeah, right. You know, I don't, it's really, I just, it's really powerful to be able to sort of pick your clientele. That's something I want to get into a little bit uh, later as well. I mean, were you able to uh, to sort of, uh, design your service in a way that, that you were attracting those types of customers? Or was that, you know, that's maybe more the, the result now. Was it was it like that at the beginning for you as well? It wasn't. It wasn't at all. In the beginning, it was like, you know, guys were like, man, I want to learn how to pick up chicks. And that was partly because our branding was the way that it was. And we focused a lot on dating because we were 10 years younger than we are now, you know, mm -hmm. stuff like that. And as we sort of grew and realized the value of the skill set was the, the ROI on something like this, return on investment, is so much greater when you apply it to your personal relationships, your business relationships, sales situations, the way that you present yourself to other people. The dating stuff is a really awesome side effect, but hardly the meat and potatoes. And so we stopped marketing it as such. And once we did that, we were like, okay, our client level just like skyrocketed from guys who were like, I want to learn how to get numbers at the bar to guys who were like, listen, I'm married, I'm on SEAL Team 6. If I can get a 1% edge in my life, I don't care how much it costs. I don't need dating crap. And then so we had a bunch of guys from, you know, SEAL Team 6, Dev Group or whatever they call it, come in. We have Green Berets come in, military intelligence. We get guys from Google, Apple, Microsoft, any really big company where they hire really smart people can see the benefit 
of this skill set moving forward for the rest of their life. And very few guys come in because they're like, I want to learn how to meet chicks, man. Because to be honest, we now really, th there's so many cheaper places to go online and, and get that information if you're just looking for the information. And quite frankly, by the time you're mature enough to be able to commit yourself to a week-long program in L.A. that's going to really tax you and be tough on you emotionally but fun at the same time, you're, you know, in your early to maybe mid to late 20s, 30s, or even your 40s, you're not somebody who's like, trying to scrimp and scrounge. Some guys are ahead of their time, and, and money really is a factor for them. But by the time guys realize the value of this, um, we just had some sales guys come in that sell computer systems that are like $12 million plus dollars. Mm -hmm. They're like, oh, yeah, I have to fly to L.A. and pay for this program, and you know, there's accommodation factors, and I need to get around, and I need to take a week off work. Da -da -da. Their biggest, they're, they're not calculating the tuition and the flight cost. They're like, the opportunity cost of me not selling stuff for a week is $38,000. That's their cost, not the tuition, you know what I mean? So it's a totally different calculation by the time you get to high-end clients or mid-range clients versus like what most people who sell things on the internet are dealing with, which is like, hey, please give me $10. Like we don't even allow, we had a dollar trial on our website for a while we got rid of it because we're like, wait a minute, why are we recruiting all these super low end customers, even for our online products? I want, you know, what we decide is we want free level, which is the Art of Charm podcast. All are welcome. It's free. You know, if you want to donate 25 bucks, we'll, we promise to spend it on beer or booze, right? But other than that, everything else costs real money. Yeah, and I, I really admire that. I mean, I think the the model of of giving everything away for free, giving people a ton of value, and then selecting those those super high end customers uh, that you can help the most, right? I mean, that's why you can charge a lot of money for it. Is that there is that ROI in there? And if you're spending all your resources trying to focus on on people who are really looking for content that they should be able to get for free or should be able to educate themselves on, you're you're definitely not maximizing the opportunity with the the knowledge set that you guys have built, right? Yeah, because the, the value is not information. The information's not that valuable. That's why we give it away on the podcast for free. And even the information on the podcast, I think, is extremely valuable when implemented. But the coaching is valuable. So we price it accordingly. And, you know, sometimes I'd say every other month or so, I'll have somebody call and be like, this is a ridiculous price. You guys are ridiculous. And I'm like, cool, we're sold out five months in advance. And we run programs every single week. And there's eight guys in each one. So you're in the minority and I don't really care about the fact that you can't afford it. It's like not my problem. Yeah. You know? and, and, and Once you were able to, uh, to sort of uh, select that market and, and figure out who those people were that, that you could help the most, how were you able to, to sort of standardize your service and, and what you were offering to make it possible to scale that up and, and hire coaches and do it on a, on a you know, weekly basis? That's the thing is just to go back to my earlier point, actually, we do offer financing and stuff for people who can't pay outright. I'm very interested in getting committed people in here, right. regardless of whether the money's going to be a hardship. That part's fine. I just mean the guys who complain about it and are like, oh, you're overcharging. Wah. Those guys, I don't have to, ain't nobody got time for that. But as far as the standardization of the curriculum, actually, it's not. That's why we cap our programs at eight guys, because you can't have, there, there's five, six coaches for those eight guys. So, you can't do something that's massively change, life changing, and I, I don't use that lightly, but it is truly massively life changing. You can't do that with 25 guys in a room getting a lecture because then again, you're just getting information and maybe a couple of drills. We need to be able to dig really deep over you know six days, 60 hours during our week long program where you live at the school. And even then we're like, okay, we've scratched the surface of some important stuff. We've given you some really good skills and really good tools and really good insight. Go forth, and then we support them for the next three, five, ten years or whatever it is in their journey. So it's very tailored to the individual. It's very tailored to the students. I don't think that we can standardize it and keep the same level of quality, which is why expansion is actually something that's really tough for us because we can hire coaches. That's tough enough, but even when we hire coaches, I can't have – 12 guys in a room and just add another coach. I've got to add another location. And right. that location has to have great coaches who have to be supervised by me, AJ and Johnny, the partners, to make sure that everything is up to snuff. Otherwise, 
now we're not able to deliver what we say we're going to deliver, which puts us back in the realm of crummy turds who sell stuff on the internet. Yeah, yeah, it makes a lot of sense, man. Um, so I wanted to ask you a little bit of uh, specific stuff. I think this is is super relevant to to travelers. Um, you know, if you're in a place where where not everybody you know sort of speaks the same language as your you know as is your first language, body language, vocal tonality, and eye contact. You know, just the the those sorts of things can make a huge difference. Can we get into some some specific tips about you know how somebody can can kind of manage those or, or work on that? So body language and first impressions and things like that. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. I mean, that, bear in mind, we spend like two and a half, three days on that stuff at boot camp, but I, I can definitely give some really easy sort of insight to that. So, and it's tough in an audio only format, but I'll give it a shot here. So, the way that it, here's a really common sort of flub that most people commit, right? We think our first impressions are made when we open our mouth. And to put it in like a fun dating context, I'll, I'll speak to guys and girls here, but. So here's here's the way this scenario might go down in in normal man world, right? There's a couple of girls, maybe two or three, at a bar. They're sitting at the bar having drinks and showing pictures from one girl's vacation on her phone or whatever and laughing and giggling and talking. A group of three, four guys walks in. They spot the girls. They look at them. The girls look over. The guys are like, whatever, we're cool. They go sit at a table in the corner. They pretend to watch basketball. They have a couple of drinks. One guy finally feels a little bit of a buzz. He does a little flyby where he walks by the girls. They notice. He orders a drink next to the girls to get a closer look. Yeah, they're cute. He gets a couple you know, shots or whatever, brings them back to his guys. They have a couple of shots. 45 minutes goes by. They're still pretending to watch the basketball game or actually watching the basketball game. Then one of the girls or two of the girls goes to the bathroom or, or whatever, and the other one stays there texting on her phone, making sure the seats are saved and the purses are safe or whatever if they haven't brought those with him. And then the guy goes, oh, man, cool, this is my chance. So he rolls over there to the bar and starts talking to the girl and says, hey, what are you drinking? And she goes, nothing, I'm just waiting for my friends, girls' night out, and then just kind of like keeps looking at her phone and then maybe even turns around to signal even stronger disinterest. And he's like, man, what the hell? Snobby girls, you know, or girls are hard or whatever. Something is going on in his head. Maybe, you know, he's beating himself up over it, or maybe he's, you know, rationalizing that he didn't like her anyway, whatever. But here's the truth it wasn't what he said was wrong. And that's why guys are always looking for like cool pickup lines and ways to start conversations when none of that even matters. Right. Because his first impression wasn't made when, it th when he thought it was. He thought he walked up there all suave, rolled up his sleeves had a little bit of liquid courage and said, you know, hey, what's going on, guys? You're pretty cute. My name's Tim. It didn't matter because that was not his first impression. He thought it was, but his first impression was made when he walked in. The girls looked over. He scowled instead of smiled, didn't approach for a long time, stared at the friggin' basketball game, had four drinks. The girls noticed that stuff. Right. And then he did a flyby, which was kind of creepy. And then he had a drink near them. And then he still didn't have the guts stones to start the conversation. So he went back to his friends. And then finally, the booze kicks in. And she's already like, dude, I made my decision about you 30 minutes ago. Get out of here. Right? And she might not be doing that consciously. And she might not even be thinking about it. But it happens anyway. Because that was his first impression. And so... The problem is our first impressions are not made when we open our mouth. The problem is our first impressions are made when we become a blip on other people's radar, which means when they see us. And the problem with that is if you're walking into a room, which is when people usually see you, you can't just talk to everybody at the same time without being ridiculously obnoxious and yelling and stuff, which is not a good first impression, right? Right. So you have to do it non-verbally. You have to do it with body language and non-verbal communication. That's how you talk to everybody at this instantaneous moment that they see you and communicate something. And a lot of people think, oh, okay, I need to remember that. But here's the problem. You're communicating with your body whether you're trying to or not. So if you're communicating with great body language, that's great. If you're communicating with bad body language and you think you're going to switch when you need it, you're wrong. That is a very common fallacy. And we prove it to people with videotape when they come into boot camp that they don't look like what they think they look like, even when they are trying. And most of the time, it's very unconscious. That's why the body doesn't lie. That's why 
experts and cops and FBI agents are always looking for clues in body language because the body doesn't lie very well, even if you're a great liar otherwise. Yeah, that so, makes perfect sense. Definitely a hard thing to, to try and just change, especially after you've got, you know, sort of years of subconscious doing the wrong thing. I could, I could totally see where yeah. having some video and having some feedback from somebody who really knows what they're talking about can make a big difference. Exactly. If you're ever wondering if somebody is telling the truth or whatever, always trust what their body says as, as opposed to their words. If they're saying the same thing, great. If they're not saying the same thing, believe the body. Right. Um, and so the way that this might work better for this guy would be he walks in with his friends. He sees the girls. He's got good, confident body language. He's not being a try hard. It's actually pretty natural. And maybe he doesn't go right up to them right away. Maybe he does, maybe he doesn't. But in the meantime, he's having a great time with his friends. He's talking with the people around him, smiling, laughing. When he goes up to get a closer look at the girls, if that's the kind of guy he is, he banters a little bit with the bartender, smiles. The girls look at him. He smiles and says, what, what kind of trouble are you guys causing tonight? Or any kind of lame conversation starter is totally fine because they're not looking for the clever thing that he's going to say. It has nothing to do with anything. And then he might even circle back around later and they're like, oh, that guy was kind of like cute and friendly, whatever. That's a good first impression and a good second impression because he's already made a good impression when he was a blip and then he came up and he proved that he was congruent with that impression. And that's what people just generally will, it takes, it can take a long time to understand that. Yeah, and that, it takes that makes great longer. sense, man. Um, it takes even longer to train the proper body language and, and to, because you can't fake confidence very effectively you can sort of try and you can sort of get the pieces in place but if you're not actually confident that's when you start looking like those try hard guys that walk with their elbows out and they kind of have like a gorilla thing and they talk about alpha males and all the other bro science that's not real um and it's really a humongous turnoff to a female that has her head on straight yeah that that makes a ton of sense um so Let's talk a little bit about how you can transition that to the business world. I mean, I know there's a lot of, of the same same you know fundamental principles that apply there. Um, what do you what do you guys talk about when you're when the question is less about meeting girls or meeting guys and and more about how to how to set yourself up to be in a good position negotiating or just to to have pe other people open up opportunities for you, have other people open doors for you. Sure. I mean, at the end of the day, the dating stuff is fun and cool because everyone's done it, but not everyone listening is in a business, right? Um, but if you're looking at applying this for business, I'm definitely able to give you a more examples and more curriculum about how this applies there. For, and it just depends. It's more context dependent. So if you're in sales or something like that and you can't master your body language and nonverbal communication, people are not going to trust you. The reason we have high-end sales guys come through the art of charm is because they need to make damn sure that people like and trust them because that's all the sale is about. It's not about the benefits of the product at, at that level of 12 million bucks. It's about how much those people like and trust you and how much they're going to hand that over. And it's relationships developed over time. It's not a used car sale. It's not a computer sale. You're not selling something in a store. This is a long-term relationship that's brokered by an expert, right? And you cannot fake that. It does not work. Smart people who are put in charge of $12 million IT budgets, they're not knuckleheads who somebody gives them a checkbook and to go run an errand. This is somebody whose job it is to, and, and has been doing it for a long enough time to be put in charge of a massive purchase, right? Yeah, so absolutely. you have to be on top of your game in order to do that. Um, another example, if you're a presenter, I know a lot of people who go around and they speak and they give talks and stuff like that, and their, their content is phenomenal. This presentation is less engaging. People stop paying attention. They maybe don't get called back the next year or people are like, wow, that content was really great, but I can't really remember the second half because they start checking their email and they're less engaged um, and generating business for that person. That person has trouble doing that. That person has trouble networking because at the end of the day, business is all about people doing business with people that they like. And if they don't really feel like they can click with you, fit with you, joke around with you, be themselves around you, they're going to want to see you less. It's just a subconscious human nature thing. And if you're hanging out with people and they love having you around, they're going to do business with you regardless because you, you're just there for the opportunity and they trust that you won't screw it up. Yeah, no, some great takeaways there. Did you have any uh, sort of specific breakthroughs maybe earlier on with Art of Charm where you were building and trying to get, get attention, get media mentions or, or get in touch with, with people that were running big blogs in your space? Any big wins with that? And you know, can you tell that story? Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to think 
back about some of the early stuff. I mean, I've been doing this for eight years, more than eight years, so it's it's tough to remember some of the early wins. I do remember a lot of times, you know, people were like, I'm not going to come on your stupid podcast. I don't even know what that thing is, you know, because back then nobody even knew what they were. And when they did, they're like, this is a waste of time. I'm too busy for this. Uh, and I remember sort of working my way up, working my way up through the ranks of of guests and stuff like that. And honestly, back then it was, a, things were, you know, I sound nostalgic and old here, but simpler times. You could go to a blog that was written by a dude who had a job and his job was not blogger. And, you know, you'd say, hey, I like your blog about this content that's sort of similar to what I'm doing. Would you mind linking to my show? And they're like, cool, I put a link next to this in the blog role. And then they would write a post about the thing that they listened to on your website and people would go listen and subscribe. And that's how that's how this stuff worked eight years ago. Now, you want to mention on a blog, that blog is a business. It's not some dude's blog. Uh, it's it's a business. It's run like a business. You want to post on there, you got to network, you got to get in there, you might have to pay for that. There's a lot there. Right, so, yeah, totally true. But there's definitely still a way. You know, I mean, the, the context is definitely evolving. But uh, I think that, you know, a key takeaway for, for listeners here is that if you, you know, start having that conversation with those people, you know, reach out, make those those short emails, comment on something that they're they're writing about, that they're working on, take a little time, you know, instead of just sending out those those mass emails, oh, hey, oh, can yeah. you do this for me? And, uh, you know, I think, I think it does still work, maybe a little bit harder than it used to be, but. Um, it's, it's, I mean, I can only speak from one, two, two different angles. My current angle is, Hi, I have a show that has 1.1 million downloads a month. You definitely want to be, I don't pitch like this, but I'm thinking you definitely <laughs> want to be on here. So if you want that, I need you to send this out to your email list of 185,000 people. And they go, damn, yeah, of course. When can we do it? Yeah. That's great. But nobody listening, very few people listening have that option, right? So the other option, uh, the other angle that I can discuss is when people pitch me. And there's a lot of bad pitches that come in. I get them more than I get good ones. And so the bad ones are always about what's in it for them, why they need it. They're begging me for something. Literally, sometimes it's, it's stupid because it, it, this is a business. I'm, I, yeah. I'm totally down to help startups if they have their proverbial SH exclamation point T together, right? But yeah. like, I don't need someone who's like, hey, can you mention my T-shirts on your show? And I look and I'm like, whoa, not these things. And they're like, please. And I'm like, no, man. I mean, I, I, I'm, anytime, w what people don't understand is anytime I recommend something that I don't actually like or that isn't actually good, I'm burning trust, which you cannot purchase. And every time I recommend something that I think is awesome, I'm building trust with my listeners that I cannot purchase, right? So I have to be careful about what it is that I recommend. And I've, I've been burned many times. I've, I've made many deals where I've thought better of it before. And it's always bitten me in the butt. Yeah. So I, anybody who's successful will not recommend something that they don't like or that they don't think will work. How do I know if what you're offering is something that my listeners will want? It's probably because I know you or I know someone that knows you. And that means that I might trust you a little bit. So do you see a running theme here? Yeah, I like absolutely. and trust you. And so then I might help you because otherwise the risk is too high and the reward is virtually zero. Yeah, absolutely. Makes perfect sense. Um, all right. Well, so just to wrap up, I, I guess uh, last question is, uh, you know, what are you most excited about in your business right now? Obviously, you've got a lot of great things going for you. What, what's the next project or, or what are you excited to, to be working on? Um, well, there's a lot of stuff in the works that's not super public yet, um, like software releases and stuff like that that just, you know, aren't going to sound that cool. But um, in the next 12 months, I do plan on at least trying to double the audience of the show. Um, it's going to be very tricky because it relies on certain partnerships that are, are, are tenuous right now at best. However, uh, it's also really tricky to, <laughs> to double an audience that's already in the larger segment of shows because the market cap is a little bit, it, it's stuck where it is, right? Yeah, in yeah, terms of you. podcast listeners. So getting getting from where I am now to twice that could be really tricky. However, I've got a great team here. The content gets better. The guests get more high profile. Partnerships with people and companies mostly that can help us get there are, are in place. And, and 2015 is going to be really good because the more people we can reach with this stuff, 
the more people we can help with it. And of course, that just gets more brand awareness, which helps us all, you know, really crush it. Awesome, man. Well, I, I really dig the ambition and I'm looking forward to, to seeing where you guys take things. Um, so where can people find you if they want to learn more about Art of Charm or, or maybe hire you guys? Yeah, I mean, I would say right now, you don't necessarily, I don't necessarily want to be like, buy our live program, because honestly, I feel like people should listen to what we do first. You're listening to a podcast right now. Listen to our podcast called The Art of Charm. It's in iTunes, Stitcher, wherever people are, wherever podcasts are sold. And uh, it's free. It always will be. You know, there's 356 something odd hours of stuff there. So go subscribe, check stuff out. There's a lot of stuff there, including an episode with you, I believe, back yeah. in the day. Yeah. And so, uh, so yeah, go and, go and dive into that stuff. And if you love what we do, and a lot of people do, then then email me, jordan at theartofcharm.com, and I'll see if what we do here in L.A. is good for you moving forward. Yeah, awesome, man. I, uh, I got to say, I actually, uh, that, that podcast that we, we did with Art of Charm was huge for us. I th- you know, we were sort of at that spot. We had, we had uh, run another business previously and had quite a bit of success. But when we moved to, to doing this a broader thing full time and helping people earn and redeem miles for travel, um, we didn't have a baseline of, a, of an audience there because what we were doing before was totally unrelated. And uh, we got a ton of, of inquiries, a lot of questions, and, and ultimately a bunch of new customers from, from coming on. So I really appreciate that. Yeah, and I mean, this is a really good case study because how did you pitch me? Do you remember? Yeah, I mean, it was a couple of short emails and just uh, letting you know what we're doing and offering to to try and help you book some flights. Exactly. You were like, I want to help you do this thing and I'm going to make it really easy and really free. And I, I don't even know if I took you up on it, but I asked you some random questions in return and took some action based on that stuff. Yeah. And then I was like, and then you said another one. You're like, hey, I'm still interested in helping you out with this. You weren't like, in exchange for you interviewing me, I'll right. help you. It was like... I want to help you with this. I like your show. I want to help you with this. I like your show. And at the time, and maybe you did pull the wool over my eyes, but I don't know. It was just like, I like your show. I want to help you with this just to see if you think it's cool. It wasn't like secretly he's going to eventually interview us and then we're going to get rich. It was more like, I want to help you. And I thought, eh, that's cool. And then after a while, you were talking about stuff and you and I were talking about stuff. I got interested in what you guys were doing. And I was like, this would make a good show. And you were like, oh, really good idea that I swear I never had. Yeah, Yeah. I never thought of coming on your show and talking about the same stuff we're talking about right now. And I was like, I see what you did there, but fair play. And I like it. And there's value for my audience there too, because you didn't, even on the show, you weren't like, buy this thing for 30 bucks. You were like, come check out what we do. And here's a bunch of free advice. And people like that. And that's what sold you the customers. It wasn't because you had a great sales letter with a stupid video on it. Right. Absolutely. And uh, also, you know, that's that's what you get long term out of relationships. It's not always going to be that you you get on somebody's show uh, or, you know, get like a huge amount of publicity out of it. But people can open doors for you. And a lot of times it's folks that you wouldn't expect, you know, maybe maybe just a relationship that they have with someone that that really is in a position to help you or you've got some mutual interests. So uh, I think that, you know, anybody building a business, uh, the the, one of the most high value things you can do to sort of leapfrog ahead and, and skip a whole bunch of bullshit in the middle is to, totally. to be networking with those people um, and, Dude, and you know, leveling you, up. You got to have John Corcoran on your show if you want to talk about networking and relationship development. He's the man for that. Awesome. Yeah, definitely will. Um, all right, man. Well, thank you so much for, uh, for joining me. I really appreciate it. What an interesting conversation. Thank you, man. My pleasure. That's all for this week's show. Thank you, as always, for tuning in. You can find show notes for today's episode at abroaders.com slash artofcharm. You can also check out the interview I did on the Art of Charm podcast way back at the beginning. That one's at abroaders.com slash charm. This week's international jam is by an Austrian-born DJ. Goes by the stage name Harav Steller. The track is called The Mojo Radio Gang. Hope this one puts a little extra pep in your step until we can join up again next week, 8 a.m. Eastern Standard. Where we are, travel safe. Hey, brothers, don't be shy. Hop over to the website and join our email list for exclusive travel hacking content. If you like what we're up to, the best way you can support the show is by leaving us a five-star review on iTunes. Lastly, we would love to hear from you, so send your show feedback to Eric or AJ at abroaders.com. We will see you next week.